Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our keynote speaker, <clears throat> who also happens to be my boss. <laughs> so if I seem a little more nervous than usual, I hope you'll understand. In fact, I've been so concerned about doing this introduction that I had to contact my good friend, John Crutchfield, at the chamber office to ask him if the NM system required us to use the intro that was included in tonight's script, or would it be okay for me to alter it some and give it a little more energy? I want to read the response I received from my good friend, John Crutchfield. <clears throat> Mark, from my perspective at the chamber, you have the green light to do whatever you want with Chancellor Sharp's introduction. He can't fire me. <laughs> In all seriousness, it's both a pleasure and a privilege to introduce Mr. John Sharp, the Chancellor of the Texas A&M System. With its 11 universities, including our flagship Texas A&M and its seven dynamic state agencies. The population of the system's universities has now grown to more than 148,000 students, with externally funded research approaching $1 billion. Through its universities and agencies, the A&M system serves literally every inch of the state of Texas. Chancellor Sharp's leadership was well recognized before he returned to his alma mater, Texas A&M, and the A&M system. He served in the Texas House of Representatives, the Texas Senate, on the Railroad Commission, and as the state's comptroller. And in 2011, he was named Chancellor of the A&M system. For that system, he has had a single, clear, expectation that we will become the best university system in the nation. And with his leadership <clears throat> and that of our Board of Regents, our progress has been truly extraordinary. Because of his record of leadership and his exceptional knowledge of state resources, it seems fitting that Chancellor Sharp has been asked by Governor Abbott to lead the Governor's Commission to rebuild those parts of the Texas Gulf Coast that were so badly damaged by Hurricane Harvey. And he is here tonight after having been down on the coast most of the day today. I know Chancellor Sharp is a proud Texas Aggie. I'll give you a chance to do that. <clears throat> but at my university, in my part of the NM system, in close proximity to the great place, we're warriors. And all of us, and to all of us, John Sharp is a warrior too. On behalf of our university, on behalf of our system, on behalf of our region, on behalf of our state. And we are very happy to have him with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Chancellor John Sharp. <clears throat> Howdy. Howdy. Ah, there are Aggies in the crowd. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate that introduction. Let me tell you about my speech tonight. I left it in Rockport in Governor Abbott's car. <laughs> it was a brilliant speech. It wasn't as good as the general gave, but it was a hell of a speech, and I'm sure you can expect Abbott to give it one of these days. <laughs> but on the way, fortunately for you, on the way from Rockport to here in the air, I wrote another one. So I'm gonna have to put my glasses on to read it. Now, when I called General Taylor and I asked him, said, General, what do you think I should talk about? He said, I think you should talk about five minutes. <laughs> so I understand the mood of the crowd, but I want you to understand something too. I give Aggie speeches. Aggie speeches are short and to the point, 
as opposed to, say, Longhorn speeches, <laughs> which have point here, point here, mostly bull in between. <laughs> but I do want to, let me further reassure you, by the way, <clears throat> the reason I give short speeches is because when I was a state senator, we had a hurricane called Alicia. You remember it came in Freeport in the kind of uh, east end of my Senate district. And I had been voting wrong on an issue called brucellosis. Now, that is a sexually transmitted disease of cattle. I, of course, had never had it. <laughs> None of the guys I went to school with had it, so I didn't know anything about it. I just knew it was a disease, and I voted against the bill. The Farm Bureau was upset because it didn't. So they asked me to go to West Columbia, Texas, and speak to a, what was going to be a 1,000 ranchers and farmers about brucellosis and how I was going to straighten this stuff up. So I did. I wrote an hour and 15-minute speech. I went to West Columbia, Texas. Hurricane Alicia apparently had come through four days before. There was lots of high water down power lines, but I went because nobody told me not to. And I went in that hall, and there were six people showed up for this speech. And I gave it. There was a guy on the front row named William McAllister, who at the time claimed to be 87 years old. And he said, you know, I'd like to hear the speech. I said, OK. It was him. There were five other guys in the back. I gave the speech. After about 30 minutes, he was asleep. I stopped. <laughs> I walked up to him. I said, Mr. McAllister, what did you think about that speech? After I woke him up, and he rubbed his eyes, and he said, son, I'm going to give you the best political advice anybody's ever given you. He said, I run 300 mother cows on the east end of Brazoria County, and when the winters are cold and hard and there is nothing for those cows to eat, I go out there once a week with a whole trailer load of hay and cubes for these cows. But I want you to remember this as long as you're asking folks for their vote. And I said, what's that, Mr. McAllister? He said, if only six cows show up, I don't drop the whole damn load on them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll get right to it. And since I wrote this so small, I'm going to have to bring it up here to do it. But there's some, some folks I want to thank. The first one I want to thank is Mark Nigliazzo for being one of the best college presidents in the state of Texas. Did you know? I love this statistic. Did you know that A&M Central Texas commissions more uh, officers in the military every year for the last five years than the University of Texas at Austin? I just wanted to point that out. We have some, some people here that have, uh, have, have been friends of ours for a long time. And by the way, also, some of your professors and some of your kids that have helped in the hurricane without being asked, gone down there. The technology you have in solar is helping folks. And all the things that you're doing with that school in this particular disaster, we really appreciate. Uh, and I want to say something about Scott, Scott Cosper. Scott is a freshman on the Appropriations Committee. They ain't many freshmen get on the Appropriations Committee. We like people on the Appropriations Committee because that's where we get our money from. So when I see a member of the Appropriations Committee in the audience, I'm going to say some good stuff about that guy. So Scott, thank you. And Hugh, Hugh Shine has been a friend of the Texas A&M system uh, for, I don't know, 10 years. Gosh, you, I've known you forever, and you're, you're a dear friend, too. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Fort Hood adds, last time I looked when I was controller or something, $35 billion to the Bell County economy. And if that was alone in its statistics, it would be enough. But I, like many of you in this room, got some chills listening to him discuss the best warriors on earth because they come from Fort Hood. And thank you for everything that you guys do and your troopers do uh, for this country. Thank you for your service. And one of the things we're proudest of is, is uh, in June of this year, the Texas A&M Health Science Center uh, put 60 medical students in Darnall 
and that is a first time deal that you guys approved and we're so thankful for and we with you are going to make that the model uh, for making military docks all over the United States of America. We think we can do it better and cheaper than anybody else and thank you for giving us a chance to prove that as well. I'll talk a little bit about hurricanes, if you if, if would. I, I don't really know anything about hurricanes, except I went through three of them. Uh, but Abbott calls me one night, and he says, hey, uh, you're going to be the hurricane czar. I said, really? I wonder what that is. And he started explaining it to me. And I said, you know, I have a full-time job. And he said, yeah, but you only work maybe, what, 10, 12 hours at the most a day? You know, they're 24 hours in a day. And, <laughs> You ain't doing squat with the rest of it, so why don't you work on this? But it has been a real pleasure working for him. I've done these projects before for, for politicians, special projects like this, and they're usually at the 30,000 foot level, sort of, you know, and read the press releases. When we go into meetings that are highly technical with county judges and commissioners, and they want to know about housing, they want to know about debris removal, they want to know about mosquito spraying and all this kind of stuff, the guy that answers all the questions in the room is Greg Abbott. He is one hell of a leader on this, and I, I wanted y'all to know exactly what your governor was doing. Uh, I want to tell you about A&M's involvement. If, if you expected me not to say anything about A&M, you probably came to hear the wrong speech. Uh, but I want, there's something called Task Force One. I don't know if you've ever heard of Task Force One, but Task Force One and Task Force Two in Dallas is a group of people that continually stay trained and they are the primary rescue operation in the state of Texas. They are sent to Hurricane Sandy, they're sent to Katrina, uh, and they were the primary rescue operations for this place. They res rescued 15,000 people in imminent danger of losing their lives. Lots of other people that were waiting in high water, but in imminent danger, they rescued 15,000 people. That is pure Aggie. That's in College Station. That's in one of our agencies. Uh, we don't crow about it a whole lot because like a lot of guys in the military, they don't like to crow about themselves. I try like hell to get them on TV. They won't go on TV. But that group of, of men and women that are Task Force One are a whole bunch of Aggies that mobilize and go to every single disaster that there is and work for, work for the people of the state of Texas. Uh, they sheltered 4,000 other people. They rescued 2,000 pets, took them over to our vet school, and the vet school had mobile units that went all over the coast to, to try to save people's pets. Our forest, Texas A&M Forest Service uh, also mobilized 1,457 people to do the same kind of thing all over the place. People left their jobs to do it. The Extension Service and some of you know what the Extension Service is. That's a county agent in 252 counties. We have offices all over the place. In Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, and all these others, basically what happens is you paid some consulting firm, uh, in Louisiana's case, $50 million, and what their job was is to stay close to the county judges, stay close to the mayors and the parish folks and all this kind of stuff, and kind of tell them what's going on. We saved you that money because the A&M system, we converted those folks for the time being from 100% agriculture to 95% hurricane. And what those folks do in every one of those coastal counties, extension agents for A&M for free, aside from their current salaries, shadow that mayor, shadow that county judge and all those people. And when they run into a problem, they call us, we get that group of people together, solve the problem. They call us and say, hey, there's mosquitoes choking horses down here. There's so many darn mosquitoes. So we call the military. They sent four C-130 gunships, took the guns off, that's good, uh, <laughs> gunships to spray for mosquitoes up, up and down the coast. Was that legal? We don't think so, but. <laughs> we, I can assure you the, the beekeepers and the organic farmers didn't think it was legal because I, I got to meet each one of them. Um, we had debris to haul off. We mobilized 65 TxDOT trucks. We've never used them before in a deal. They're, that's questionable, but those 65 trucks, 
that are all up and down the coast are really helping those cities and counties move debris out of people's front yards and things like that. And we're very appreciative of TxDOT for, uh, for doing those kinds of things. Uh, we've got 47 disaster recovery centers all over the place. And about 500 calls come in from mayors and county judges a week to address specific problems. It's all headquartered in College Station, and I'm so proud of the A&M system, and, the, and including Mark's folks, uh, for being a part of this team that is going to produce the best recovery and rebuild operation and be a model for the other states in the future. We actually have uh, the housing part that we're doing has never been tried before anywhere in the United States of America. Uh, we can put you in a FEMA trailer, which costs the government uh, $150,000, $200,000 per trailer. Hell, we ought to just give somebody $100,000 cash and we make money and everybody be happy on the deal. But instead, uh, what we do is we, we're having a direct payment deal where somebody that's out of their house can come to us and say, look, I need to get my kitchen working, I need my bathroom working, and I need to get one bedroom working. If you can get that doing, I'll come back home, and then I'll worry about the rest of the house later. And so we've got about 755,000 folks so far that have contacted us to go into, into that kind of thing. And so I think we, we've got some out-of-the-box things that are, that are where we've got lots of people helping people. But the reputation of Texas was seriously enhanced in this disaster when everybody in this United States saw those folks out there with their boats and their airboats and wading in the water and helping their neighbors and things like that. People that weren't a part of Task Force One, but by God were just neighbors that came from Dallas, for God's sakes, and Wichita Falls to go down there, wade in the water and get people out. That brought Texans together and that, that made community. The school teachers will tell you in those areas that the kids come to their classrooms just with a whole different attitude toward each other and the, the, the family atmosphere that has been created as a result of this uh, is something that, that is a positive that's come out of, that has come out of all this. But let me tell you a little bit of something about A&M. A&M is the largest um, research university, not just in Texas, but in the southwestern United States. You have to go all the way to the East Coast or all the way to the West Coast to find a university that has more research, almost a billion dollars of research. We're about 13th, 14th in the nation in terms of total volume research. And we don't do BS research. We do how do you cure Alzheimer's? How do you, how do, you uh, do all kinds of things? We're starting a new program, uh, which the general is aware of in, in uh, in Houston with Houston Methodist University that just got announced and it's called the uh, InMed. It's the first of its kind in the nation. Those kids that go in there will get a degree that makes them a doctor, but they'll also get a master's in engineering. And what they learn is how to operate the robotics, how to do all of the technical things with chemistry and so many other things uh, that solve people. Like they tell us, you know, in 10 years, there won't be kidney donors anymore if these kids have anything to do with it. You will grow your own kidney from your cells right there in a Petri dish, and then they'll put that in you. I watched as a 3D printer put an ear on a guy two weeks ago. Made me sick, but I watched it. <laughs> it is some amazing things that are going to come from some really smart, smart young people. Uh, our vet school is third in the world. Our engineering school is the largest engineering school in the United States. 25% of all the kids at A&M are engineers. And that is one of the top 10 engineering programs on planet Earth, not just the United States. Our Mays Business School is climbing up the charts. The law school in Fort Worth, which is new, uh, is the uh, fastest rising law school in the history of law schools in the United States. When we first bought it three years ago or so, it wasn't ranked. It was like in the top 700, 800 in the United States, something like that. It broke the top 100, and we're gonna be knocking on Baylor, and every, we passed Tech a long time ago. We're gonna be knocking on Baylor and other, other folks' doors here pretty soon. We, our graduates, have the second highest starting salaries in the nation behind University of Pennsylvania. They are the third highest recruited 
men and women when they graduate of any university in the United States of America, according to Forbes magazine. And uh, it is because of our students. If you haven't been on one of our campuses, including this one, they're all the same. When you go on any one of these campuses, all 11 campuses in the A&M system, but particularly College Station, and act like you're lost and don't know what you're doing, take a map out, fumble with it, and see how many dozen kids come up to you and say, sir, ma'am, can I help you? And then, if necessary, guide you to the library. I was never able, actually, to take anybody to the library because I, I never was in the library, but <laughs> there, are, there are kids there now that actually use the library. And they, I mean, it is, it is really uh, amazing. If you want to feel good about the future of the United States of America and the future of Texas, walk on our campus for an hour or two and you will feel darn good about it. Our students, where else in the United States of America would you go on a Tuesday night to the basketball arena and see 10,000 kids in Bible study with no adults present anywhere in the room? Every Tuesday night. They started, they started, a, break, uh, they started a, a big event program where they decided to help the folks in Brazos and surrounding counties. It started several years ago. It's been adopted by a lot of universities since then, but never as big as ours. 25,000 kids will show up at 6 o'clock in the morning on two given weekends with hoes and shovels. No adults organize this. Uh, paint, whatever, and fan out in the community and the surrounding counties to help old folks paint their houses or repair their fences and all this kind of stuff. That doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, I, my favorite story is uh, several years ago, about three years ago, the head of Parks and Wildlife called all the chancellors of all the schools and said, look, Bastrop Forest burned up and we need to replant those longleaf pines out there and we've got the seeds. The reason they had the seedlings is because the A&M Forest Service fortunately preserved a bunch of those seedlings and we need to plant them, so we need some volunteers, and we need about 1,000 of them. And indeed, 1,000 kids showed up. 987 were from Texas A&M College Station. There were 13 from the other universities in the state of Texas. Not to be critical of anybody, I'm just pointing out. <laughs> but I think that the reason for that, when, when I left A&M in 1972, I was in the Corps. And the Corps was dwindling at the time. It was Vietnam was over, and the Corps was sort of dwindling down. And I remember on that trip back telling my dad, place is going to be just like the University of Texas or any other school uh, in 20 years. The Corps is going away, and the Corps won't even be here anymore. Boy, was I wrong. The Corps, number one, is growing. It's about 2,500 strong now and growing every year. Uh, but the whole student body is infected with that. The core is the keeper of the spirit. They teach the traditions to everybody else. But if you have a son or daughter to A&M, I promise you they love the place. They are infused with it just like all the rest of the world are, except they you know, make good grades. My outfit was done away with when I was at A&M. I had to move to a different one. And we called the commandant and said, why the hell did you do away with our outfit? And he said, son, your grade point ratio and your blood alcohol level was the same number. That's <laughs> why we did away with it. But I, I had some t-shirts made and I distributed them to the core and the t-shirts say, the core mixes the Kool-Aid, but everybody drinks it. And that's what happens. That's what happens. It gets infused into, peop in, into the whole student body where else would 50,000 kids show up for midnight yell practice the Friday before a game just to practice uh, yelling for the next game? Um, the traditions are intact, and I'm, proud to, and I'm proud to say that. Now, for the last uh, four weeks, and actually for all of this week, I just flew in here from uh, Rockport. Um, I have started every meeting. I walk in, I quote Ronald Reagan. I said, we're from the government, and we're here to help. <laughs> and you know they all believe that. But I have to tell you my favorite story. It was in Victoria. And there was a guy that I've known for a very long time named Anton Kaliba. 
And he came up to me before the meeting and he said, you know, I've been thinking about my house is damaged. I've been thinking about asking for some of this money, but I hear there's lots of strings attached to it and I don't know if I want to deal with government. And I said, well, you know, we'll sure do your, be do your best and kind of lay it out for you. And I said, what's your concern? He said, well, here's my concern. I think government is just like what happened to Anton Kaliba's dog. Of course, I'm going, what the hell is this? I said, what happened to Anton Kaliba? He said, well, you know Anton Kaliba? I said, I do. He, I didn't know he was still alive, but he's a blind man that lives in Victoria. I said, yep, got that CNI dog named Zeke. And I said, yep, remember Zeke? He said, well, Anton one time was walking along Main Street and he got to Constitution Street and decided, you know, he was going to cross the street and Zeke stopped and he stopped. But he hadn't taken Zeke to a grassy area in a very long time. And Zeke had been drinking a lot of water. And Zeke just hiked up his leg and wet all over Anton's brand new suit and ruined it. And Anton reached in his pocket and pulled out a dog biscuit and gave it to Zeke. And across the street was the only member of the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals that we had in Victoria County. And she comes running over, hugging Anton, said, that's the most beautiful thing I have ever seen in my life. You love and depend on Zeke so much that even though he wet on your brand new suit that you bought at Melvin's Globe Clothiers for $350, even though he ruined that suit, you gave him a dog biscuit. And she was hugging and kissing him. Finally, Anton pushed her away and said, ma'am, there's something I need to explain to you. And she said, what's that? I said, the reason I gave Zeke a dog biscuit after he wet all over my leg and ruined my brand new suit was to find out where his head was so I could kick his ass. <laughs> <laughs> and, he said, <laughs> and he said, I want to know if I take this dog biscuit from government, is the same thing going to happen to me? <laughs> now, I do want to, I do want to answer one question. There is a guy here from my outfit, who, who I haven't seen in a long time, named Kenny Hill. Kenny Hill, where are you at? Stand up. Kenny Hill, stand up. There's Kenny Hill over here. Kenny and I were classmates. We were in the same outfit in the Corps, as was a guy named Rick Perry and a bunch of other folks. And some of you may remember that Perry barely, barely beat me for Lieutenant Governor in 1998 <laughs> and involuntarily ended my political career. It's his fault. Let me tell you what happened. <laughs> People ask me all the time, what is your biggest political mistake? I said, it occurred when I was a fish at A&M. And this is, folks, a true story. It has been revealed before, but this is a true story. And he here's what happened. Our first weekend at A&M, me and Kenny Hill, because Kenny was the only one who had a car, he had a Chevrolet Impala with beautiful Krager mags that later got stolen. But he and I and a guy named Bob Shepard, also from Hillsborough, and Rick Perry, uh, decided to go to Waco for a big weekend. Now that's what we knew about Texas. We're going to Waco. <laughs> <laughs> so we go to Waco. When we get to Waco, we learn that George Varpal, whose house we're staying at, daddy is a Baptist preacher. We did not know this. And so, we go outside and they said, well, we got, to, we got to find some beer somewhere where you go. And the only two people that had fake IDs were the two future politicians, me and Perry. <laughs> and so we go to the, to the Shell station, which is still there, that sells all the kolaches, I can't remember the name of it, on I-35. And we go there, Perry and I go there to buy this beer. And Kenny Hill is supposed to pick us up directly. We hitchhike over there, and he's supposed to pick us up. So we buy these two cases. I think back then the rage was slit, slit malt liquor, right, Kenny? Anyway, we buy this beer, and we go across the street to that street light, across the street, uh, across the interstate, and we're waiting under there for Brother Hill to come pick us up. And he didn't come, and he didn't come, and so Perry decides to get into the beer. He was always a cheap drunk, but he decides <laughs> to get in the beer. And I get in the beer. Some motorcycle folks, this is a true story, I promise you. <laughs> motorcycle, you can't make this stuff up. Motorcycle guys drove by. I was from South Texas, and I could read banditos on the back of their car. 
uh, the back of their jackets, and I knew this is, this is, these are not people that you mess with. Perry from Paint Creek had never probably seen a motorcycle before, and so he waved at them. But he didn't use but one finger in the way. And they stopped and came around and got off of their bikes, and three of them, one was swinging a chain, and two others, and your governor was behind me squealing like a puppy. <laughs> and he kept saying, do something, do something. It was cricket season. You know where the crickets all gather and everything in the fall, and there are just thousands of them under that street light, and I didn't know what else to do. My, my wife would kill me if I'm telling this story publicly, but it is true. And I reached down and picked up two handfuls of crickets and put them in my mouth and just started chewing them. And the cricket juice is running down, and the guy gets about 10 feet from us, and he said, they're too blanked up to fight. Let's, let's go home. <laughs> now, you ask yourself, you ask yourself, why is the man saying that is his politi biggest political mistake? Because had I not eaten those crickets, they would have killed Perry, and, <laughs> and I would have been governor of Texas. Thank you very much.